Welcome to the Global Tech Leaders Podcast, where we help business leaders and individual contributors with actionable insights to hit their number and figure out the nuances of truly operating a business globally today, squeezing the essence of the lessons learned from the planet's top tech leaders. This is your guide to joining the fast track to global market scaling. Welcome, I'm Ross Lauder, your host from Single Focus Talent, and I'm joined by our non-exec director, John Quigley, today. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So welcome. Today, we are joined by Cara Pellander, VP of Global Account Management at Aventry. Cara oversees Aventry's account managers in EMEA, North America. She brings to the company more than a decade of experience in technology, sales, and account management. She started back in 2018 as VP of Account Management. Um, and was quickly promote, promoted into her current role. Before that, she was Senior Director of Account Management at Active Network, uh, a global marketplace offering intelligence solutions through uh, data and insight platforms. Uh, she had an eight-year tenure there and rose up the ranks from supervisor to senior director. Uh, and in this role, she was responsible for over $200 million in annual revenue across six business units. She's an innovative approach and described herself as a passionate strategic sales leader and attributes her success to the use of innovative data-driven strategies to exceed targets. She loves turning challenges into successes and uh, sees obstacles and finds opportunities, which I absolutely love. So excited to have her. Welcome to today's uh, show, Cara. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's our pleasure. Well, look, let's dive right in. So maybe if you could just share with us uh, your career journey thus far, you know, what are the decisions and inflection points that you took uh, at each stage and maybe what were the kind of uh, factors that excited you about them to, uh, to bring you where, to where you are today, as it were? Sure. So uh, actually, while at university, I had my first exposure to the meetings and events industry. I actually worked for a brewery at the time uh, that had a fantastic property and uh, acted as an event manager there. And that's where I sort of really ignited my interest. Um, so post-university, I went to work for Active Network, which was just mentioned, um, a SaaS technology company that managed uh, primarily registration and event management across a variety of verticals, and initially went into the technical support side of the business. Uh, but I, I had a very smart manager who recognized very quickly that maybe I was better suited to sales. And so uh, while I moved into a management role on the technical support side, I ultimately moved over to account management, um, one of our smallest verticals, and was able to start growing that team really quickly and see some success there. Um, and from that point forward, it was, uh, you know, foot on the gas, if you will. And I continued to take on different verticals and, and teams over my tenure at uh, uh, Active. And by the end of it was running account management for the entire business, which was extremely gratifying. Um, what's interesting, though, is along the way at Active, there was quite a bit of change um, for the company. So when I started, it was relatively small, a, a few hundred people. It was private, uh, based in San Diego, California, and uh, we went public after a few years. And going public didn't quite go as well as planned, and ultimately we were acquired by a private equity firm, uh, Vista Equity, and had four and a half years as one of their portfolio companies before we saw a successful exit uh, for 1.2 billion, and then went public again with our acquiring company, um, global payments. And so I think for me, there was a lot of uh, inflection points along the way when the company went public, uh, when we relocated our headquarters from San Diego to Dallas and became a private company again, um, and then ultimately going public again. So there was a lot of different moments where there's quite a bit of turmoil and change. And uh, as mentioned in my bio earlier, you know, I saw a lot of people sort of lean out or exit the organization over the uncertainty or just the level of change. And, and I decided to stay put and see what I could make of the opportunity. And, and it worked out really well for me professionally. Um, so ultimately, after that, that good run at Active, I wanted to take my talents elsewhere and, and come back to an organization where I felt like there would be a strong culture of innovation and and that's what i found at eventry so um, the past two years here have been fantastic and a real opportunity to leverage my uh, experience growing and scaling teams 
Wow. Okay. That's quite comprehensive. And I suppose one of the things I took from there is, uh, you know, you're not a stranger to challenging times and, um, you know, maybe some messaging, <laughs> et cetera. So um, what I'm curious to dig, on, dig in on is, um, you know, what does account management mean to you? Because it's a broad term that I've heard used when it can actually mean uh, a sales job. Sometimes it can mean a um, more of a customer success function. And, and today, as we're all involved in the SaaS industry, you know, churn being the dirtiest word of them all, account management becomes the vital function in the organization. So maybe if you would take us through your kind of account management uh, through those difficult times and like, how do you steady the ship when you're getting crazy questions from customers and, and keep that retention KPI where it needs to be, if you could share some of that. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because account management is, a, you know, a really interesting function at this point in time, particularly in the SaaS world, now that there is, you know, an entirely different group of customer success management. And I don't know that there is a ton of clarity out there between the difference of account management versus customer success. Uh, from my perspective, account management is really responsible for uh, the revenue that comes with an account and making sure that you're growing and retaining that revenue. Um, whereas the customer success side to me is much more about uh, engagement with a, whatever the solution is and ensuring that they're meeting those um, goals and objectives that they set out with uh, when they purchase the product. And so for me, when it comes to account management, I <laughs> It's fairly basic. I'm a big believer in sort of foundational elements, but I think account managers have to be responsive. They have to be credible. You've got to do what you say you're going to do so that you earn that client's trust um, and so that they, they want to continue to partner. And, you know, over all these years of, of change that I've dealt with within the organizations that I've worked in, and certainly now in, you know, the current circumstances with COVID-19, I think being that steady, reliable person that a client can trust is looking out for their best interests, is offering them, you know, new opportunities that may help get them out of a situation that, you know, is sticky, particularly, you know, in these interesting times that we're in, um, is really, really critically important. So I'm sure you've had all different flavors of people <laughs> jump into these uh, account management roles. Uh, how, many, how many levels of account management um, do, do you guys have? What I mean is, you know, senior, junior, enterprise, um, what, way, what way does that work? Uh, at Aventry now, we, we've got two levels. So we've got our strategic account managers and our standard account managers. Um, at one point, we did also have a, a more junior role, but ultimately, as we've refined the team, we, we did away with that. Um, you know, we, we wanted to have a certain standard of, of experience and, and, and excellence, frankly, um, for the roles. So at this point, it's, it's a two-tiered approach. Very good. And in terms of those different flavors, you know, I mean, it's, it's well documented that A players generate about five times more revenue than B players and, and about 10 times more revenue than a lot of the low level seeps. And, you know, somebody in your role to, to kind of source, hire, onboard, coach, train and develop all of that talent uh, re required to, to kind of execute the sales strategy is tough. So, um, What's your secret? <laughs> that, that, that's my question. What is the secret sauce? So, yeah. um, so hiring is obviously incredibly important. Um, as, as I think everybody knows, you know, a, a, a mistake there can be very expensive and time consuming. So for me personally, um, I invest quite a bit in that process and making sure I feel really good about who we're bringing on board. Um, you know, in terms of qualities that I'm looking for, you know, experience is great, but um, really it's a mindset. I'm looking for people that have a high level of accountability that, you know, really want to elevate the, their team. You know, it's account management is very much an individual sport, if you will. You've got your, you know, book of business that you've got to look after and, and grow. Uh, but I really like to make sure that all of my team members, you know, fit together well, that there's a collaborative culture, that together they're elevating the performance of the whole. Um, so I'm looking for people that are rock stars, obviously, um, but those that are going to be, you know, really strategic in their approach, really accountable. They do what they say they're going to do. If they tell a client they're going to do something, Something. It's executed at the highest levels and again that are going to be a great team player because uh, I really believe that you know you're only as strong as your weakest link and and together you, know, you can really achieve a lot more so uh, those are some of the qualities that I look for and, and cultivate within my team. When do you get involved um, 
in, in the recruitment process? Do, are, are you involved throughout the entire process from sourcing or do, do you empower and trust other people to kind of get uh, candidates to a, to a particular point in time and then, and then you, you, uh, you kind of engage or, or, or speak to these uh, prospective uh, employees or how does that work uh, for, for you? So uh, I like to be involved initially in terms of communicating, I guess, my vision for what I'm looking for in candidates and making sure that whoever is assisting, whether it's, you know, an internal um, team member for HR or if we're leveraging, you know, a recruiting firm, uh, which we have done, you know, many times, I think it's really important at that outset to explain, you know, who you're looking for in, in a fairly high level of detail, um, you know, both from a qualitative and quantitative aspect, you know, if you expect a certain number of years of experience or specific industry knowledge or whatever it may be, as well as those more intangible qualities um, that you're looking for. So I like to set that, um, set my expectations about that up front. Um, in, in a word, I tried to, or in two words, I guess, setting expectations I think is really critical um, for hiring and for account management. And then I sort of allow that process to unfold and then engage later once, um, you know, my trusted team members have said, this is somebody that meets the criteria that we'd like to work with. At that point, I re-engage and, and ultimately am more of a final decision maker. So there's a lot of trust along the way, but I try to set up front what I'm looking for. Now, do you use role plays at all in, in your in your hiring process? Um, occasionally, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a standard practice that we do, but um, I'm, you know, especially hiring for sales, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in your ability to, to tell a story and, and sell me on, you know, what your experiences and what your successes have been. And so I try to create those opportunities within an interview for somebody to do that. Okay, so so give us um give us a sense of the org chart here in terms of the you know the uh, the amount of people, the amount of managers, you know, um, so we can get a feel for what you have to wrap your arms around on a on a kind of daily or, or weekly business <laughs> or daily or weekly um um at yeah. um, uh, uh, time. So we've experienced a lot of shifts organizationally um, as a result of COVID. And I actually, over the past few weeks, have taken on some additional responsibilities at Aventry. So uh, the title is changing. So I recently acquired ownership of our account executive team globally. Um, so right now I've got a manager of that team and there are seven total uh, account executives. I also have... So what's the difference, sorry, just for, for clarification, is it account yeah. executive signs new business, is it? And then the account Correct. manager... Okay, okay. Yep. Yes, exactly. So our, our account executives pursue new business while our account managers grow our existing business. And then again, we have a customer success team who's responsible for uh, client satisfaction, engagement, and adoption um, of our solutions. And so I also have our global account management team. Um, right now, that is about um, 13 account managers globally and um, two directors under that group. I also have our uh, client success management team. Um, and then we have a separate business that we acquired, um, similar roles, but um, slightly different vertical. And um, I've got about four individuals there. So I think in total right now, I've got 26 direct reports, oh. or sorry, total, um, and about seven direct reports within that. Sounds like your next stop is like CRO or something like that, yeah. Cara. If I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I'm going to be honest with you, um, that that that's what it what it sounds like to me. That's um, yeah, that's quite the span of control. What's the difference between a director and a manager f for you? I mean, if if you were because you've been both, um, uh -huh. so what what's the distinction there between your one of your directors of sales and one of your managers? What's the difference? For me, it's a level of, of autonomy and authority. Uh, obviously, it comes with experience, but you know, I distinctly remember uh, in my career when I made that leap from managing a single team to being a director. And for me, a director typically, you know, there's different titles at different organizations, and I've often found that you know, title correlates more with the size of the organization than you know the actual responsibilities. For me, a director though is is much more significant than a manager in terms of 
their experience and their autonomy when it comes to decision making. Um, so, and I, I also believe that you shouldn't really be a director if you've got just a single team. Um, you know, maybe that's a reflection of the, the years of experience you've been doing it. But um, I'm when I hire a director, my expectation is that I can set a vision for them, I can set a strategy, and they can go execute it with with very minimal handholding or um, you know requirements on that regard. Whereas at a managerial level, I'd expect to provide a lot more day-to-day -day direction on how to execute on, on whatever our strategy is. Okay, that's quite clear. And I, I suppose uh, you've hit on a couple of things there that uh, grabbed my attention around setting expectations. And um, I'm a big, big um, uh, stickler for that. Um, I've recently done a pretty large construction build domestically. Um, but one of the things that really drove me insane was people setting an expectation and not delivering on it. You know, I'm actually fine with somebody giving me bad news and letting me know that up front or setting that right expectation. Um, or, you know, even beating it. That's fine too. But what I absolutely deplore is somebody saying they're going to do something and not do it. Um, and for these, unfortunately, in that particular industry in construction, it seems to be par for the course. But talk to me about your kind of value set and what you look for in others when you hire, because I'm a big believer that our values define us. And you know, when you're sniffing out talent and you're looking for somebody who really resonates with your core belief system and your value set, what is it you're looking for? And, and what is it that um, kind of is, is a vital and then a, kind of a nice to have as it were? Yeah, for me, uh, it really comes down to those elements that it sounds like we wish were more associated with uh, you know, con the construction industry. And I've been through a big project like that myself. Um, I'm really looking for those that exhibit you know, integrity, credibility, trust. You know, there's a lot of things you can teach people. And, and those are, are qualities that I think are, are really hard to teach. I think those are innate. Um, and I'm really looking for somebody that will take accountability um, and, and take pride in the level of quality. I think that's been a hallmark of, of my success and one of the reasons I've always been able to grow professionally is I hold myself to a very high standard and I look for others that are going to do the same. Um, I also think, you know, when it comes to, to sales, responsiveness is critical. So, you know, I need people that are going to take very seriously doing what they say they're going to do and, and being responsive. Um, and it's interesting. So when I was in university, again, I worked at, uh, at a brewery and I spent several years just, you know, waitressing, acting as a server. And there's an anecdote that I, I always like to tell my teams to illustrate this is, you know, you can work in a restaurant and, and have the kitchen be backed up and the food's going to be out, you know, an hour later than it should. And there's often two sort of ways that people approach this. There's, you know, the, the server or the, the, the waiter who's going to avoid that table and, you know, hope that maybe, you know, maybe they won't notice that it's taking that hour for their food. Or you can take the approach of being really direct and upfront about what's going on. You can reassure the, the customer that, you know, you're going to keep their water full and drinks in hand and, and, you know, bread on the table or whatever you can do. And, you know, at the end of the day, one of those scenarios <laughs> results in a tip and, and one doesn't. And, I, you know, I use that as a, a illustration for my team. It, you know, there's there's no there's no point in avoiding bad news. You know, we say two points for bad news at Eventry. You know, let's talk about it up front and let's see what we can do. You know, to make the best of the situation. So, um, you know, that's really what I'm looking for in my team is just again that honesty, integrity, credibility, and and that responsiveness. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And you know, it's funny. I, I come from a small family business background where. You know, my dad brought me in at 15 and put me on the phones answering customer queries. Uh, I also worked as a, a bar, a bar uh, bartender and lounge boy, uh, serving people in that similar capacity. And I think that frontline piece is like a complete advantage when you step into your career proper, right? Where you're actually dealing with issues that are, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, has a bigger dollar value associated with them. But those core traits that you've learned in that capacity um, are really a foundation, right? They're um, a, a core element to, um, you know, being successful. And, and I would put it down to taking ownership. So, yeah, I, I, fully, I fully support that. I suppose as we shift gears here a bit, I mean, um, talk to us about some of the challenges, you, you know, you kind of had and, you know, talk to us about Eventry, talk to us about your solution and then kind of how the current climate globally in terms of the pandemic, yeah, is, is potentially an opportunity and, and how you're working through that, if you would. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as an industry, the meetings and events industry has been particularly hard hit by COVID for what is probably obvious reasons. Um, you know, the the limitations on on meeting in person and um, you know around travel in general have had a huge impact. And uh, you know, initially. It, it was one of those situations where I didn't think, I don't think any of us really knew how far the situation would go or what we'd been dealing with. And, you know, when this started happening, it was, you know, in February, uh, early March, and we had just had our, our kickoff and, you know, had just outlined all these strategies and things that we were going to do for the year and had a really, really amazing start to the year and, and we're sort of hit hard by this. And so it's been really exciting for me personally and uh, to see Eventry in particular and the industry as a whole um, adapt to this sort of unprecedented challenge. Um, you know, we've had to pivot our strategy and instead of focusing on live in-person events, which have been the standard for years and years now, um, you know, we ultimately have had to move away and determine, you know, what our clients' needs are now. And so, um, you know, we started that process just by really connecting with our client base, with our prospects and saying, how can, how can we support you what do you need during this time and and that led to the development of our new um, you know eventually virtual event platform and so what that is is essentially a fully integrated solution um, within our end-to-end -end management solution um, that enables our our clients to be able to pivot and adjust really flexibly how they're going to approach their events so they can still if they're maybe if they're in New Zealand they can have a live event um, but for most of our client base, they're now looking to produce their events virtually. And in the future, we assume that they're going to be pursuing a more hybrid approach once in-person uh, meetings can happen again. And, and when I say hybrid, I mean essentially having, you know, that live in-person component, but also including virtual elements for those that may not be comfortable or able to travel to be able to experience, you know, that a meeting or event, um, you know, in the same way. So for us, it's been huge. How, how do you do that, um, Cara? Let me visualize this. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to visualize this so you know um, g give me a simple example of um, you know an event and then how, how that kind of hybrid in-person thing would kick in or what happens or just break can you break it down um, for so, Mr. Layman over here please <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely so our standard event management platform currently uh, enables clients to um, build market um, you know and then report on ultimately uh, their events. And so our typical solution prior to our pivot to virtual, you know, again, enable clients to go through that process of of planning, sourcing, managing, marketing, um, and then analyzing their events. So, so who'd be your typical kind of client or persona um, in, 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 um, in that regard? It would probably be somebody in marketing, right? Somebody in PR events or something like that, would it? We work with a ton of marketing teams and CMOs, um, depending on the size of the organization. Um, okay. You know especially with uh, our larger organizations, there's often, you know, a meetings and events dedicated team as well. So we work with some really large financial institutions, um, you know, really large uh, organizations in the transportation industry, really large tech organizations as well. So these are global companies that typically have a, a dedicated meetings and events team. Um, but we also have, you know, many uh, SMB businesses as well, where it, it typically would land in the responsibility of of marketing, especially because live in-person events take up such a huge portion of marketing budgets. And, um, you know, people realize that face-to-face -face connections are often the best way to, to drive their brand home and, and to ensure quality outcomes. And so I think that's what's been so challenging about COVID-19 is taking away that in-person element and, and figuring out how to replicate that experience virtually. Okay, so I'm a transportation company, I'm running an event. Um, let's just say it's uh, it's an event i run every year um, yep. um and and, so, and and please feel free to keep me honest here if i'm if i'm, yeah. if I'm going <laughs> off course right that it's not you know it's not your typical customer or it's you know i'm, I'm getting it wrong here but um i'm a transportation large transportation uh, company i run an event every year i i, I um i you, you typically have used your platform but now um there um is a possibility that the attendees that would normally come, some of them are kind of all in or all out. Um, 
and the all out people, I need to cater for them. So now, now you have a, um, a virtual piece of this event. And essentially, what is that? Is that just like streaming live from the event or what is that virtual piece? It is, it's um, streaming technology. And so ultimately we have created within our platform, the streaming technology that enables uh, our clients to distribute information, whether it's, you know, uploading slides or, or doing something of that nature, as well as, uh, you know, the conversation we'd be having now. Um, yeah able to do that live. Uh, we actually just leveraged our platform yesterday um, for some of our strategic clients. And so uh, we had a keynote from our newest board member, Lisa Choi Owens, who's the chief revenue officer at TED conferences. Um, so she's a huge asset in her knowledge and experience right now. So we had a keynote with her as well as we did a live Q&A. We had a client panel come in and, and speak about how they've adapted to the challenges of COVID. Um, we were able to do quite a bit of Q&A. Um, and then we have a virtual lobby, so we were able to, after our main session, go into breakout sessions and, and have a really um, intimate conversations about the nature of the platform and answering any questions. So uh, it's a fantastic platform in that it really enables people to uh, replicate, again, the live experience that, that you would normally have um, and do all the same types of content and um, sessions that you would if you were to go uh, attend an event in person. That's really cool. Um, I, and it's case in point about what can be done uh, if, if your organization is agile enough to be able to respond to either situations or clients or customers or, um, and, and really kind of manifest that feedback and then uh, kick back out with, with something that has, has value to the um, to, to the market. It sounds like you, you guys are, are very closely aligned there across the functional areas, you know, between product and marketing and, and, you, and the sales org. Yeah, it's been great to see, you know, everybody sort of rise to this occasion for me, you know, I, I obviously the impact of COVID is, is devastating globally. And, um, you know, you hate to minimize that. But, you know, there is part of me that sort of loves the intellectual challenge that we've all been faced with, which is, you know, how do we adapt to this unprecedented change? And I'm really excited about how Aventry has risen to the occasion, the cross-functional collaboration that have has come together across our organi organization to build and take to market you know, this product as quickly as we have. And, and I think you know, the reason it's been so successful is our approach has, has really been with our, our clients and, and our prospects at the core and building what they need and um, really listening to them because there's a lot of uncertainty um, from all of our clients about what to do and how to approach this. And so, um, you know, we've taken very seriously our ability to deliver something for them and, and just our, our thought leadership responsibility in providing best practices and equipping them um, for this new reality that they're facing. From the outside looking in, um, for me, um, it seems like from a cultural perspective, w will you talk to us a little bit about the culture of the organization? It, it's, it looks like there's uh, a very conscious effort around uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, and, and, and I say that from uh, just a cursory view at your organization. There, there seems to be a lot of women in key positions, which is wonderful. And, you know, all, all that whole um, that whole in inclusion and, and diversity thing, it, it seems to be, um, is, is that a deliberate thing in your organization or kind of how does that work? What's the culture like? Um, it, it, for me, it seems wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you honest, talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, it was actually one of the reasons I, I joined Aventry is, you know, I was looking for my next opportunity and where I could take my experience and, and you know, hopefully make an impact. But for me personally, um, especially as a female in sales and, you know, in a more, you know, senior leadership role, I was looking for a place where that was valued and, and where, you know, I, I wouldn't be an outlier because, uh, as I'm sure you're both aware, you know, sales in particular can be um, a bit of a boys club, as can, you know, executive level leadership. And so, you know, I think Aventry really keeps that uh, top of mind. It is a priority and a focus for us. And, and I think it's become even 
even more so after you know recent events, um, not just in the US, but globally around the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that. I think we've sort of doubled down on our diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, we've come together as an organization um, to have really frank, open conversations and dialogue about what we can do and, and how we can really practice what we preach. Um, you know, there's been a lot of internal efforts on, on supporting it. And I know for me in particular, having recently gone through hiring, um, I know I made that a priority when working with our recruiting firm is to see, you know, a diverse array of candidates and make sure that the team that I put together is one that's more representative of, of the general population and doesn't perpetuate, you know, that boys club stereotype, if you will. I uh, I couldn't uh, support that more, and it's funny. I uh, I've worked in organisations where literally the decision making process was uh, done in uh, what I envisioned, at least in my mind, to be a dark cigar filled room with a light swinging in the middle of the room, and uh, it was very much a boys' club. And you know, I was always of the kind of questioning mindset where I was like, okay, guys, show me the data behind this decision, and you know obviously being somewhat facetious it wasn't uh, it wasn't there it wasn't present and I suppose um you've really um kind of I suppose hit on a lot of the things that we see successful organizations embracing in today but I suppose tell me where does that come from like who do the who are the authors and the speakers that you look up to and how do they help shape your kind of mindset and how you set that tone and culture if you would it's funny, I always feel awkward asking that or, or, you know, discussing that topic for some reason because um, it's as though, you know, Cara, when I said, um, you know, it, it seems like there are a lot of women in, in, in key positions, et cetera, et cetera, as though, you know, for some reason that that is, you know, n not <laughs> the norm or not normal or something like that. But the reality is, it is not the norm <laughs> is my point is that and the point that you made as well and the point that ross is making about the smoke filled cigar room etc cetera, etc cetera, like that's still very prevalent in in organizations today and the for for us it seems you know uh, almost strange that that people would still have that mentality and for me and, and the people that we, we speak to, it's, you know, absolute table stakes that you would have cast your net as wide in terms of, you know, that kind of uh, diverse, you know, um, um, uh, uh, people that you would be looking for to, you know, join your organization and to add to that culture, you know. So it's, um, it's, always, it's always a little bit tricky, I think, or a little bit awkward around kind of, you know, even even today, you know, around being politically correct, I'm even asking that question properly, you know? Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And, you know, I, I'm on the younger side for somebody who's in my role. And, and as a female, I think there's just some inherent challenges with that. So I guess, you know, to to answer the original question, you know, who I look to for inspiration, um, I've been very, very uh, lucky to work for um, just some very strong individuals over the course of my career and and in particular some some very strong females um, and again I mentioned earlier you know we have our newest board member um, Lisa Choi Owens and again I was working with her just over the past few weeks when it came to planning this this customer virtual event that I referenced and um, you know I personally am very inspired by women that have been able to break through um, you know a lot of these inherent challenges and and stereotypes about who people are looking for for these types of roles um, and and I'm a big believer that you know you can't you can't generalize you know it, if, if it came to my personality and, and you looked at my individual personality traits you know being very ambitious and very career oriented and all of those things um, you know you might ascribe those qualities stereotypically to a man so I never want to assume oh if I'm hiring a female she's going to be very sensitive and empathetic and I think you know it's dangerous to do that but at the same time I'm a mom and you know I saw something recently that you know is a study that showed that you know 
uh, female leaders and, and those that are in particular moms, you know, tend to have a more empathetic approach and more successful teams and really understand well how to delegate and, and all these qualities that you learn from being a parent. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting just to, to be at this, this point in time. And, um, you know, I know that having a daughter, I'm, I'm personally very motivated by you know trying to to blaze a path for her so that it's it's easier when she's running a company someday. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I uh, I have a wife who works full time in a, in a senior leadership position and has a um, considerable number of reports, um, direct and indirect. And um, you know we 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 quote unquote run a family together. And I think. Um, you know, she's my rock. She's a rock star in my world simply because the amount you have to manage is just mind-boggling, um, and it's particularly prevalent today when you're we're, you're working from home, um, because um, there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more distractions. There's a lot more uh, of your time that is needed, um, and I know there's a lot of means kind of floating around uh, in respect to that. But I suppose take us through, you know, your thoughts on on where we are now and, and what that looks like, uh, you know, in terms of that that uh, working from home dynamic what what do you think where do you think we're headed and uh, how how have you guys at adventure you know what what are you seeing seeing and what kind of customer conversations are you having about this new norm as it were uh, it's interesting. So I feel personally that I've been at an advantage, you know, in this recent, uh, you know, shift for everybody working from home because I've actually been a remote employee for the last six years of my employment. Um, and it, it was triggered initially when uh, my previous company was acquired and they moved our headquarters. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like I proved my sales medal at that time because they mandated everybody moved and instead I stayed in San Diego and, and somehow got a promotion out of it regardless. But so I've got a lot of experience in, in working remotely. I personally don't think it, it needs to be um, a barrier. It certainly hasn't been for me in terms of, you know, forming connections, creating strong teams. Um, we're, we're so fortunate to have the technology that we do. Um, so I feel like it's been very, very uh, seamless for those of us at Aventry and maybe because, again, I've been um, sort of managing our teams remotely for so long that I, I recognize what works. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to have tools at our disposal that facilitate that. And, and even more so now, you know, with our virtual platform, the ability to just foster those, um, you know, intimate connections, despite, you know, the distance and the miles. At this point, you know, acting with empathy and just realizing the struggles and challenges that people are having and, um, you, know, you know, having as much flexibility as possible while still, you know, keeping standards high is, is how I've been approaching it. And, um, you know, just recognizing that we're, we're all experiencing unprecedented times and, uh, you know, it requires just a level of empathy that maybe we wouldn't otherwise associate with, you know, doing business yeah I know I know what you mean it's uh, we're in a situation where our schools are on track to open on the 27th I have a seven and a five-year-old and a one-year-old in fact as well and wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, a busy household here uh, and we were in the middle of a building site too but we'll, we'll park that for now because I'll only get frustrated talking about it but, um, <laughs> I'm in there so I, I understand yeah. Uh, so yeah but I mean we're, we're on track to have the school start and, and that's all very very positive and so on and I'm gonna have to kind of figure out my life but I, you know and, and work in between all of that with along with my wife but I suppose I, what I'm interested to know is like how do you given that you've worked remote for this long I suppose this is the complete norm for you anyways it's nothing new but when you're talking to your team and you're, you're working with them we, we've spoken to a number of guests here on the show where they talk about different activities that they do um, to kind of build that bond remotely. And it could be the case that, you know, we have a lot of clients we work with where they're, they're actively hiring right now, but they're not physically meeting these candidates, right? And, uh, you know, establishing that connection and that fit is really, really important. How do you guys kind of do that remotely? What are some of the tools, in, including your own, that you guys use that you're like, this is how we have to do it. Without it, we would be uh, not able to do it. Like, walk us through some of those things that you do with your team, if you would, and the tools you use. Yeah, um, so it's it's interesting that you asked that because um, eventually, you know, sort of quickly realized that I had this long experience uh, acting as a remote manager and we're a global organization. We've got, you know, offices 
in you know Asia Pacific, Europe, and you know North America. And so um, they asked me early on in my uh, when I joined the company to create a remote management course that we provided to all of our managers and ultimately made in available to individual contributors. And so a lot of the tenants that I covered in that are are very applicable now. Um, and for me, it's you know again leveraging technology, making sure that you know you you've got uh, you know videos up and you can tell if someone's got a haircut or um, you know or if if a, a you know a kid's running around in the background you have a better sense of you know what's yeah. going on I think you know it's really important to sort of replicate that water cooler conversation. You've got to build time into your meetings, particularly those one-on-one -on -one or team meetings, to talk about you know the day or the weekend or what's going on in their lives. You know, I think some people are so quick to just want to jump right into the business at hand, and and people really crave that connection. And you know, that's sort of the foundation of what Aventry is about is, is connecting better um, between people. So for me, that's really important. Again, I just hired a bunch of new people. We had a big um, virtual sales happy hour at the end of the week last Friday, and everybody just picked their favorite beverage and joined and shared their screen. And we had dogs and we had babies, and you know, you can see who's who's drinking scotch and who's got a beer in hand and who's sipping water and who's pregnant and all of those things. And I just think it's really important to keep that connection strong and um, you know, really make sure that people feel a part of the team, they feel supported, and and they feel seen. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I've heard so many stories recently. My wife, in fact, shared one recently with uh, somebody who <laughs> on her team who was smoking during a Zoom call. And I said, uh, she said, look, I know this shouldn't matter, but please don't do that on calls because it's <laughs> off-putting, right? Because in an office yeah. scenario, it's like, it's what not, like Mad Men was, right? It's like 1950s and stuff. That just is not okay. And it shouldn't be okay <laughs> in a virtual setting, right? Um, yeah. But there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. I think there's some people that, you know, have taken this sort of work from home environment and it's just such a, a dramatic shift from how they would be in the office. And so I think, you know, keeping video on and those types of things help, you know, elevate the sense of professionalism, um, you know, that you want to maintain regardless of, of the work environment. And so, yeah, if somebody was smoking on one of my, uh, <laughs> my video calls, I probably would have a word as well. How about at one of the virtual happy hours? Would that be okay to have a cigarette at one of those? <laughs> I'm sure, especially if you're in Europe. Well, we can't judge. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting, all right. Yeah, I, I, it's certain in Middle Eastern culture, um, it's completely fine, it's totally acceptable. Um, whereas Western Europe and North America would very much be a no-no. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. That's it's one we never thought of, one we never planned for, right? So um, these, these sorts of things come up. Um, I suppose as we kind of wrap up here, um, would you take us through what you feel your superpower is and some of the things you're really passionate about in life? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me personally, my superpower is uh, my ability to adapt and, and change to circumstances. And um, I think it was mentioned in, in my bio initially, but um, I really like to, I guess I'm an eternal optimist. And so I really like to see the opportunity and challenges. And, you know, I think where in some cases people might you know, really dwell on, you know, the perceived negatives of, of an event. And, and certainly COVID is, is one that I know a lot of people have felt, you know, very heavy over. Um, I think my brain just naturally goes to like, where can we find the good? What can we make out of this? And, and how, can I, how can I make something good out of the situation that's happened? And I think for me, it's been critical to have that mindset over the course of my career. Again, there's just been a lot of change, even though I stayed with one company for, for a little over eight years within that there was so much change and um, my ability to adapt to new leadership, adapt to, you know, different styles of doing business um, has all served me very, very well. Um, so yeah, I, I would have to say that that's my superpower, if you will. Would that mean that it's difficult for you to let go of stuff that maybe might not be working? Is that fair to say? If you have, no. it, if you're an eternal optimist around things then, but maybe some things just aren't going to be um, the way that, that you'd, you'd hope them to be. How do you deal uh, with that? 
No, actually, I think because I'm, uh, you know, I naturally accept change as, you know, sort of an inevitable part of life and, and embrace it. Um, I think I'm actually very quick to pivot. Um, and, you know, I am, I really like a data based approach to things. You know, I love that I'm living in a time where we have so much data at our fingertips. And, you know, I think it's one of the, the strengths of, you know, of entry in our platform is providing all of this data for people to make, you know, strategic decisions about. And so for me personally, you know, I really like to measure um, and analyze the, the results of what we're doing. And if, if we're not seeing the results that we expected, you, you have to change. Otherwise, you don't see success. So um, for me, I think, you know, there's that eternal optimism. But for me, it's it, it more comes into play where if something's not going as planned, I just think, okay, well, that didn't work. And the data shows it, what can we do to tweak it and do better? And, and that's where that optimism comes in is thinking that my next try is going to be successful and, and doing what I can to make sure that it is. Uh, that sounded like an interview question. My apologies. But I, I genuinely was interested. Yeah, no, I was interested. <laughs> To see how you'd answer how you'd answer that, you know, my my dad was um, had had a he was a very miserable guy, you know, and he had um, he had a, a famous quote all the time that he he used to he used to say that you know inside every silver lining is a cloud, and <laughs> <laughs> I think he had that the wrong way around. But you know, for me, it's it, it sounds like your your mantra is in every cloud is a silver lining, possibly. Um, Absolutely. And um, it's it's a great outlook. To, yeah, it's a, it, it's a great outlook to have. I, I was speaking with yourself and Charlotte bef before this, and she, she commented on how infectious that is in 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 your own organization. And you know, it's it's something that you you have to live and breathe, isn't it? Rather than kind of just talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I recognize my visibility, you know, for my team, and and I think it's really important, especially in senior leadership, to sort of set the tone. And so, you know, if uh, you know, no offense to to your dad, but you know, if you're the type of person that's just going to wallow in in the challenges, it trickles down. And so, I want my team to see, you know, my enthusiasm and uh, you know, that my ability to adapt and embrace, you know, the realities of the situations that we're facing. And make the most of it. And yes, hope. listen, no, no problem disrespecting my dad. He deserves it. Um, <laughs> here's a question for you. Uh, before we finish up, it's a fairly superficial question, but um, what recent purchase have you made up to 100 bucks that has improved your life over the past few weeks? Oh, recent purchase up to 100 bucks. This is a good uh, ending question. Let me think about it. I'm trying to think what I've bought. That's okay. In the meantime, you can answer this one. Where did you buy those earrings? <laughs> These earrings are from Target. They're very fancy. They're, um, they're quite large. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are quite large. Um, they were actually a gift, I think, from my sister, but uh, I think she got them from Target. I'd say in terms of a purchase that has changed my life, a life recently. Or just improved your life. Something, something you've purchased in the last month, say, because yeah. it's no secret. There's people buying a lot of gizmos and gadgets and, um, you know, stuff that they might not normally buy, but um, just something that you've bought for a hundred bucks or less that you feel has improved your life. Uh, it's going to be a surprising answer. And, you know, this outs the mom and me. Uh, That's okay. My, you know, I, as a parent that is sort of appalled at the amount of screen time my children have right now while I'm busy working away in another room, I recently purchased a set of 1,000 dominoes, so just the little wooden blocks, and my children have spent countless hours now setting up, you know, chains of dominoes across yes to set them off and so I think that's probably the most impactful purchase I've made because it's kept them off screens it's kept them really busy while I'm working and uh, it's something I'd have zero mom guilt about so for me that that's been a win. are they doing different levels ups and downs or is it just no, like absolutely. all straight lines or oh no and it's like swinging bells that knock other ones over nice, and, wow, nice. yeah it's about as fancy a low tech toy as as I could have gotten for them, but it's uh it's been fantastic. That's I'm going out right now and I'm going to buy vast <laughs> amounts of dominoes because I I uh, you've just put something in my mind that I can envision myself and my own family here uh, getting hours of enjoyment setting up all kinds of 
labyrinths and all kinds of stuff you know that uh that could be enjoyable mm -hmm. that, that's a great that's a great purchase i love it in slow motion as well when you go to knock them over that's that's sort of the linchpin for my kids as they spend all these hours and then you know use the iphone to film it in slow-mo and it's very dramatic and when they all fall and the patterns and whatnot so highly recommend Carrie, you've inspired me there to make that purchase myself for my own children. Um, I yeah. recently, um, I spent, uh, um, outlaid uh, for a gigabit broadband connection because myself and my wife are working from home and our kids are no stranger to Netflix. Um, so, you know, that yeah. streaming puts put bandwidth constraints. So I thought getting the gig gigabit connection would, would improve my life. And I just realized now, retrospectively, you could have saved me an awful lot of money with that purchase. <laughs> Um, yeah, I went the opposite direction as you. I sort of tried to just get them off the the devices. Yeah, no, big time, and that's that's the right way to do it. I mean, what we've done is we've got a lot of art supplies, and our kids love to do painting and all that kind of stuff. We recently learned they purchased oil-based paints and not water-based paints, and our brand new painted doors have have stains on them. But you know, such is the new norm as we um progress and navigate through through these strange times. Well, look, in any case, I really wanted to thank you for joining us today. I think there were some really important takeaways for our listeners that they'll get a ton of value from. So I really want to uh, show our appreciation and look forward to uh, hearing from you and Eventry in the future and, and on the direction you're going and, and have you back on a future show, if you would, Carol. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. And again, we're doing so many exciting things at Aventry around our, our virtual platform. I'd, I'd love to come back and tell you how it's gone, especially because we, we are launching to market on September 3rd. So just a few short weeks here and, uh, and are the first in our industry to do so. So we'd love to come back and give you a progress update. Sounds good. We'll hold you to that. Thank you very much for your time today. And we look forward to that next slot. Thank you, Cara. Um, be safe. You've been listening to the Global Tech Leaders Podcast, designed for both established and aspiring career-focused tech rock stars, as well as helping leadership figure out how to speak global in today's multicultural world. For further details, check out sf-talent.com.